in intros are always a little difficult to listen to because they always make me sound so professional and put together and then I'm like, I just make indie games, yo. Um, but thank you so much for the lovely intro. Uh, thanks so much for coming out. I know it's the last talk of the day, I think, one of the last talks of the day, and it's really warm in this room. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, I will try and use lots of energy so that you all know that I'm warmer than you all are, so then the sacrifice feels kind of fair, right? Um, so yeah, just to redo a little bit of that intro to, to give some context um, and to tell you why I might be worth listening to on this subject. So my name is Rami Ismail. Uh, I used to run an indie game studio called Vlambeer. Vlambeer was best known for games such as Super Crate Box, Ridiculous Fishing, and Nuclear Throne. Um, one interesting thing about Vlambeer is that it was uh, originally founded back in 2010, which meant that it was very early in the indie scene. Uh, I'd been around for you know, a, a year or two by the time that started. So as the indie scene grew, a lot of the things that sort of evolved, we were part of that, we saw those happen, we saw how it changed, and that gave us a really interesting perspective on uh, what happened. I also, in that period, created Press Kit, which was a toolkit that uh, is now sort of industry standard. If you make a Press Kit, it probably looks like the one I made. That was not intentional, I just wanted to make a thing for myself. I'm a programmer, I'm lazy. So when I had to make the third Press Kit in two years, I was like, fuck it, I'll automate it. And then everybody else went like, cool, can, you, can we use it too? Uh, so that's what happened. I run a game dev, uh, I run gamedev.world, which is an online conference in eight languages. We're doing a new one actually, December 9th. Um, listen to some speakers you normally couldn't listen to because you don't speak their language. You know, if you've never heard somebody from India speak on game development or from Japan or China or France or, you know, any of these languages that you don't speak, we'll translate it live for you so you can listen to them speak about what they've learned, what they've found, and the things you would never be able to hear at a conference you know, anywhere else, because you would need to speak the same language as them. I used to run a panel at GDC called Number One Reason to Be, where I brought people from all over the world to GDC to get a shot at uh, being part of that. I write a newsletter called Leveling the Playing Field, which is uh, free if you want some good advice on in independent game development. You can check that out. And I tweet way too much. If you read my Twitter, my apologies. I try to do better, but I fail. So, I do always give a disclaimer before most of my talks, and I want to give that disclaimer here as well. It's a very simple one. Anybody who comes on stage and talks here today is giving an opinion, right? Even in the way we present the facts. Even if we're talking about facts, we're all just looking at the facts from different perspectives, right? So I started in this industry when independent meant make a flash game, make 30 grand, and then make an indie game. And for us, the word indie meant no publisher. In fact, we hated publishers. We thought publishers were the worst thing that ever happened. I'm, eh, they might be, but they might also not be, right? They have their benefits. Um, but the world just kind of changed. Now, for the past few years, after my own indie studio, I've been trying to help other people run their studio. And to do that, I have a consultancy that people can use. It, try to keep it very cheap, very affordable, even free for some people. And so I hear a lot of stories about game development. I hear a lot of stories about how people run their game studio. And you hear really interesting stuff, stuff you learn from, stuff you, you can uh, stuff you can take away, make better games with. But you also hear a lot of bullshit. And I want to talk about the bullshit. I want to hear I want to talk about the things that I hear where I immediately go, oh crap. Don't do that. And then I have to explain that to them. So, in the hopes that I don't have to have that phone call with you in the future, I'm just going to tell you the 12 most common things that I think you could do better if you're running a game studio. Now, not all of these will apply to you. Some of them might not be for your type of studio. Some of them might not be for where you are in your career. But they might be good to hear. So, how not to run a game studio uh, based on conversations with about 1,500 developers that signed about $30 million in deals uh, over the past, what, five to 10 years? Um, here we go. Four topics that I want to talk about. First one to go with, team. Team is the most important thing you have as a game developer. It is. Before you have a studio, you have people, right? And the people want to ma make a studio, and that's how you end up making games. So before anything, there's humans. 
And when we talk about humans, there's a few things that I would really like to challenge. And I'm going to go with the quote that people say, and then why I think it's a bad one. Okay? This is going to be the entire presentation. <coughs> we rise to the challenge. And this is one you hear a lot from teams. They say we rise to the challenge. And it's often a result of, say, a student team going to the market or um, you know, a studio that has been growing and they grow up with the challenge, right? And I think that's a terrible idea. I mean, in fact, you can see that it's a terrible idea. Look at the industry right now. What's been happening a lot? Layoffs. Why did those layoffs happen? For a while, things were really good. So everybody rose to the challenge to the opportunity for what we could do. And then that collapsed, and then we had to get rid of all those people again. Right? So it was overconfidence in a market that was going to crash back down. People just hired up because that's where the challenge is. Indie studios do that too. But what I would say is you don't want to rise to the challenge. If, if the challenge is like right here, grow to there. Grow like right below the challenge, right? Because growth is not a thing you do because you can. Growth is a thing you do because as a decision, it's the best thing for your studio, right? It's an intentional thing. And the reason for that is actually fairly simple. Studios grow along very standard patterns. So if you're a studio of one to seven people, you probably have one producer, yeah? And the producer is sort of like the keystone of how this works. Because you have one producer managing up to seven people, right? Now say you have 10 people. That's too much for one producer. So you hire a second producer, right? Now you have a second producer. But now you have a producer doing half the work, because they're only managing three people. And you could really use a little bit of extra art help, right? So maybe let's hire two extra artists. Before you know it, you're about 14 to 16 people. That's the second stopping point. After 14 to 16, when your studio grows, you go to 25 to 30. After 25 to 30, you end up at around 60. Every studio I've ever seen grows along that pattern. It's very rare that the studio does not grow along that pattern. And they don't do it intentionally. It's not like all of us sit there together and it's like, oh, it's time to grow to 20 now. No, no. <laughs> It just happens automatically, because that is sort of how teams grow. That's how your capacity grows. But if you go and you're at seven people, and you go like, OK, let's hire two more people, you're going to be hiring up to like seven more people. right? That goes really fast. It forces you to make bigger games and riskier games, because now you have more people. And that might take you away from what you're best at. Leads should be good at their thing, not just managers. This is actually one of the worst things that happens in games. Leadership is its own skill. So an art director, yeah, they have to be good at art, but they have to be really good managers too. That's how you get a good director. The problem is that we have not figured out how to give people promotions without giving them more managerial responsibility. So say you have a really good artist, amazing artist. Why is the only way we can get them to grow in their career to make them a manager, which they might not be good at, which means they have less time to do art, which they are good at? I don't know how we fucked this one up, but we fucked this one up real bad. Industry-wide, this is what happens with our programmers, with our artists, with our designers, with our writers. We just promote them into a job they don't like. And it's the only way we have them grow. So we need to get around this one, because bad management will kill your team. The key word that I don't like here is seems. Words are really easy. It's really easy to make it feel like we agree about something, right? And I do this exercise a lot. And if you've been to my talks, you might have heard this one before. But if I say a word and I ask you to come up with the first word that is related to it, right? I usually use the word sun, burning ball of lava in the sky, right? What is the first word you think of? Sun. Heat. heat. Who else said heat? Just raise your hand. Two people. Who thinks they have a word that more than 20% of the room has? Light. Light. Raise your hand. Light. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten. No? Anybody else? Moon. Moon. Two, three, four, five, six. So here's the thing. The ratio will always be the same. It'll always be about 20% of the room max, right? Usually 10. And that's just because we all are different people. I think Egypt. I'm Egyptian. Sun reminds me of vacation. My family lives in Egypt, so that's what I think of. 
unless you're Egyptian, you're not gonna have that word. Even if you are Egyptian, you're not gonna have that word. So our individual, like history, the way we think, is always gonna make that not the same thing. So if you think you're agreeing, you're probably not. So in your communication, please use the language of the thing you're communicating about, right? So say we're communicating about the sound. I don't want you to, I don't want you to describe sound. Make sound. You're like, Ew. that's not good. I want it more like, Ew. your sound designer will go like, yeah, I can do that. But if you go like, no, I want a bit more of a screech. Like, what does, what does that mean? I hear people go to program and say like, yeah, it needs a bit more like whoosh. <laughs> How the fuck do I program whoosh? <laughs> so when it seems you agree, you usually end up with alignment issues. You don't actually agree. So I need you to define what you're making in the language of the thing you're making. Design, prototype, paper prototype, flowchart. Programming, pseudocode, flowchart. Art, art. Sound, sound. Narrative, draft. We know how to do this, just do it. Get it on paper, then start working. The amount of games I come across, people are like, yeah, we're making a game about love. It's about uh, people missing each other anyway. And then there's the combat. <laughs> like, here's the thing. I, I think everything is a remix is fine, and things mashing together is great. But like, th there is, if you want contrast, and that's usually what people are trying to get at. They want contrast, they want gameplay, they want action, they want something to juxtapose. It has to be intentional. It has to feel like a coherent part of your design. So just going like, yeah, we're making it about love, and anyway, then you shoot some people, that, it doesn't work. If you can get a good reason why in the world of this game, that's how it works, and it feels like it's a genuine part of design, absolutely, go ahead. But very often, people think that if you take like uh, racing and, and, and um, hacking, that now you get both audiences. You get the racing audience and the hacking audience. They might both be interested in this game. The reality is, most racing people do not give a shit about hacking games. And most hacking game people don't give a shit about racing games. So instead of getting both, you actually only get the Venn diagram intersection of the two, which is smaller than each of these circles individually. So if you're gonna pull this thing, we're gonna mix Stardew Valley with Halo. You're gonna have to make a pitch in either of the directions. This is an actual pitch I once got. So if you're gonna make a game, what is the core vision of your game, right? What is at the heart of it? That question needs to be answered. And just going like, it's like this plus this is not a core vision. That's a description of two genres. I'm very sorry if you're making this. So the problem with this is that this sounds like a unique selling point, but it's not. The fact that you made it is not unique because every developer is the creator of their own game, right? Our take means nothing to me. It means nothing to anybody. And that's kind of a shame because when it comes to unique selling points, I think one of the things people forget is that a unique selling point is not just important for the design of your game. It's also a really good exercise in marketing and communication. If you can figure out what your unique selling points are early in development, you can not only develop a more focused game, but you'll also be better at communicating that game when you go to market. So if you tell me your take on Super Smash, I don't give a shit. Why is your take good? I want that, answer me that question, right? And the same thing, I very often hear unique. You know what's a really unique pitch? Punching the person who's listening to you. <laughs> Never happens, you think it's a good pitch? It's not. So unique is not a useful phrase. It doesn't mean anything. What is unique about it? Is it more clever? Is it more interesting, intriguing? Is it stranger? Is it more, like what is it? More appealing, good, our take? Those words mean nothing. You want a pro tip? Whatever word you use, think of the opposite. Put that in your pitch, and if that sounds like a real pitch, keep it. Keep your original word. If it doesn't sound like a real pitch anymore, don't keep it. So if you have, we have 12 good levels, nobody ever goes into a pitch with 12 bad levels. Nobody goes in with 12 clever levels and then the opposite, 12 dumb levels. That doesn't happen, right? Find words where the opposite is still a valid pitch. That's what sets your games apart. Just saying the obvious thing 
it is good, it is clever, it is interesting, don't give a shit, because everybody would say that. Why else are you pitching? I always get a little angry at this one. So whose idea was it that we need to make good impressions on our playtesters? They're not Polish. They're an integral part of game development. You don't make good impressions on your playtesters, you playtest. The point of playtesting is that it can be shit. Because the playtest will reveal to you in which way it is shit. So a lot of developers use playtesting as polish. When they get to like, you know, beta, they go like, oh, it's time to playtest. That means that if there was something you could have caught in vertical slice, you've now built on it for two years, and at the end you have to fix it. That's really hard. If you had caught that in prototype or vertical slice, it would have been much easier to fix. So don't use playtesting as polish. Use playtesting as an integral part of your development. Do it throughout your process, continuously, not just at prototype, also at vertical slice, also in production, also at alpha, also at beta. Just keep playtesting. So the worst article that ever happened to the games industry is this article that said that Valve has a flat hierarchy. I think it's the worst piece of writing to ever grace the games industry because everybody goes like, oh my god, Valve does that, we should do it. You know what shit about a flat hierarchy? It doesn't work. It doesn't even work at Valve. As somebody who worked at Valve, what their experience was with flat hierarchy, nobody likes it. Because it means that the way decisions get made is popularity contest. Politics, backstabbing, talking to each other, that kind of stuff. Well, really what we need is we need to be able to go, this went wrong, you're the one responsible, sorry, not you, but like, you're the one responsible for that. <laughs> you're the one responsible for that. So how are we gonna fix it? That creates a clean process. What creates a clean process is everybody knowing, okay, I'm doing this, this person is the one who's gonna sign off on it, so that's the person I ask questions to. If it's all just conversation, it's not gonna work. Even in teams that are co-ops, or that are uh, um, flat hierarchies, they will establish hierarchies for processes. Fully flat hierarchy is completely useless. It doesn't create anything. It creates confusion, it creates lack of clarity, and ultimately, it will bite you. And it always does. Same thing here, flexible. Flexible just means lack of deliveries, uh, lack of deliverables. It means that people don't want to de define what they're doing, they don't want to define where they're going, and they don't want to define what they're ultimately going to be accountable for. Important in process it th is that there is a system of accountability, that we know you're in charge of this, you're doing this, Here's how we sign off so that if it goes wrong, we can look at it, go back, fix it. So whenever I hear we want to stay flexible, to me it means you don't care to create a process where we can actually check whether you're doing it right. Now that doesn't mean I need you to write a giant document with a thousand things. I just need you to sit down with your team and have a chat about how we sign off on things. How do we create a task? Who signs off on a task? That's all. I don't need anything else, right? But if you can do those two things, you create one really useful thing, which is small wins for your team. You know what's really shit for a team? To just be working on a thing that they never get to because you never defined that there was a goal. You know what's really good for a team? Being able to sign off on a thing. You know that satisfaction of just checking a checkbox? To-do list, done? That. Just creating accountable ways of having some sort of deliverable will improve motivation on your team. As long as you can be realistic, obviously. You can't. You can't, you don't. More time never fixed anything. That's not how, no, well, not never, but in general, in game development, if something isn't working, more time is not your solution. Your solution is figuring out what is wrong, why it's wrong, and then setting a clear time in which you're gonna try and fix it. But very often what happens is people go, oh, this, this almost works, let's do some more time to do another iteration, then it almost works, then they do another iteration, then it almost works, they do another iteration. Then six months later, I'm asking them, what have you done? And they're like, well, we fixed this. But also they're out of money and they're bankrupt. That didn't work, right? If you have a problem, just adding more time, it doesn't work. What does work is being very clear, okay, how long are we gonna take to try and fix this? And for an iteration, you want to know the best trick I ever learned? For every iteration, set what happens if the iteration fails. Not just if it succeeds, what happens if it fails? What happens if this iteration doesn't work? What, the, what if the goal of this sprint is not met? What do we do then? 
and especially early on in development, that can really help. Um, on this one, actually, one more thing I wanted to add. When it comes to deliverable and process, or actually, is that a hit? Oh, that's a hit. Never mind. Process. Sorry, I have to go real fast because she already did the zero minutes thing, so I'm just, I'm just going real fast. Um, we'll figure things out as we go is a lack of process. I think when it comes to lack of process, um, a lot of developers, what they do is they just kind of fluidly move between the different stages of development. We have ideation, we have production, we have post-production. What I want you to do when it comes to these processes is to always think of them, if, if you've been to an airport, you know those two doors that you always have to go through that are like one-way doors? Mm -hmm. Treat your process that way. If you make the commitment of moving from ideation to production, it should be a one-way door and you don't go back. If you go back, the alarm goes and people yell at you, right? <laughs> I tried once, bad idea. Um, but you move in that direction. The reason for that is that if you keep going back, every time you go back, the later you go back, the more you actually break in your game. The only reason you go back ever is if where you are now definitely isn't going to work anymore. At which point you need to ask your question, how the hell did we end up going through that door in the first place? Right? What went wrong that we're between these two doors now and we have to go back? So remember when I said publishers might not be great? So they can be great, right? Like funding, management, that kind of thing. This thing, though, I hear a lot right now. And effectively what's happening is I call it pitch stalling. And pitch stalling, very simple, is this thing. A lot of publishers right now don't want to take a lot of bets. So they're being slow, they're responding slow, and very often they ask for more information. And the problem is all of these things mean no. Everything that a publisher says that's not a yes is a no. Now, some publishers will come with feedback. That's not a yes. That's not even a we're interested. That's a no. Because you know what it looks like when they are interested? They'll make an offer and negotiate. They'll make an offer and they'll talk. If they're not making you an offer, it's a no. And you should treat it as a no. You should continue to pitch to other people. But what publishers will do is they'll give you feedback. And what developers will do, because it's so hard to get a publisher right now, is they'll go, they'll stop development on their game, and they'll pivot to fix that feedback and then pitch again. Believing that it might become a yes, but it never becomes a yes. In 1,500 calls I've done, and I've probably helped sign like several hundred games in that period of time, I've only seen it happen once that a publisher had feedback, the developer went for three months around, did that, and then the publisher signed it. And every other time it just came down to, no, actually we're still not interested. Because they're not. If they were interested, they would make an offer. That simple. Right? Feedback, it's really nice, but that's just a nice way of saying no. So if you get that, doesn't mean you have to stop talking to them, but keep developing your game the way you were developing it. Don't go around for some publisher just because they have some fucking money. <laughs> Actually, one of the most common calls I got, um, yeah, no. Marketing is an integral part of your development. You should think of it as an integral part of development. In fact, you should be thinking about your marketing while you're iterating on prototyping. What about this will be easy to communicate? What about this will be easy to show off? What about this will look good in a trader? What about this is fun to communicate to people? How do I communicate this to people? These are questions you should be asking at the start, not because you want to lead your game design with marketing, but because your marketing is a really good way. Like figuring out whether you can do good marketing is a really good way of figuring out whether you figured out your own unique selling points. If you can communicate this game well, you've figured out your unique selling points, that's worth chasing. If you can't do that, Figure out how you would market this game before you go too far into development. It really makes a difference, especially as an indie. We don't have the luxury of just fucking around at the moment because publishers take two and a half years to sign any fucking thing. So uh, don't think about marketing near the end of your development. Start thinking of your marketing as an integral part of your game development. Most of the issues we talked about come down to assumptions, and the assumptions are usually misplaced focus, mismanagement, misunderstanding of your creative process. The nice thing about them is all of them are fair, fairly easy to uh, avoid. All you need is to create clear decision-making processes and figure out how you focus your creative development on a core vision that you can communicate with your team and outwards, right? Something that is coherent, something that is consistent, something that when people hear it, they go, ah, yeah, I get it. When you get there, you're in a good spot, you do development. When you do development, you follow processes that you agree on at the start, you follow them to the end, and that's how you make good video games. Cool, questions?
All right, we have about five minutes for questions, so that should be about three questions. Who wants to go first? It's really warm in here. Then I have a question. Go for it. Did I scare everybody? Is that what happened? No, go for oh, it. Oh, here we go. We got, we got, we got an audience question. Excuse me, it's a little bit an off top, but what is your first association with the word sun? It's Egypt. Uh, <laughs> Egypt, because my, uh, my, uh, my father is Egyptian, so for me, the sun reminds me of going to my family. Uh, which also guarantees that I've never seen anybody do that, but I, will, I can guarantee you that exercise, every room I've been to, whether it's a thousand people in the room or tw ten people in the room, it, it's always about maximum 20%. Nobody ever gets above it. Okay. Never happened. Thank you. Cheers. What is question over there? Man in the white. Uh, hey, Rami. Uh, so about the um, uh, promoting people, right? If they can't become managers, what's the, what's the other road, basically? I mean, the other road is just, you know, a, they need to get to a point where they have a title that is hireable, right? So, you know, you do want to get people to a senior position, potentially. Like, if people want to grow towards the director position, that's okay, right? If you have an artist that is like, hey, I love art, but I also, you know, I want to be a director. Sure, but then give them management training, right? Like, make sure that they're ready for that, make sure that they're good at that. And if not, you increase their pay and you find a new title for it. Like, we make up a lot of bullshit in this games industry. Just make up, and we don't even agree on what producer is. Like, try asking a Ubisoft person and somebody like, hey, what does a producer do? It's like, eh, we don't fucking know. Uh, so, you know, just make up a title. Just a super senior artist. I don't know. Like, make up some shit. I, I, I actually have a friend who's a very, very senior environment artist, and she's now called Advanced Level Artist. Yeah, let's this go. This is the new thing. Level six senior <laughs> environment artist. Let's go. <laughs> More questions from the audience. More questions. We go uh, over here. Uh, thank you. According to that uh, current situation, what do you recommend? When's uh, uh, time, uh, right time to pitch uh, to our right. uh, to our publishers? Really good question. Um, so in development, right, the whole trick, the reason we work with publishers is because it offloads risk from us to an external party. That's it, right? So every day you're working without a publisher, you're paying for that day. As soon as the publisher pays for it, they're paying for development, which means you can safely make the game. Even if the game does horribly, that's their problem now, not yours, right? And to be frank, that's the way this is supposed to work, because if the game is very successful, they get half of the money while you develop the game, and all they did is give you money. So it's a relatively exploitative relationship, and that's okay, because we can exploit them back, right? Which also means when it comes to pitching, a lot of people say, like, oh, we only pitch to the, to the publishers that we like. No, hell no, pitch to everybody. Literally email everybody, right? And people go, like, I don't want to waste their time. I don't give a shit. Waste their time. They get paid for it. It's a great job, right? Like, get their feedback, and then with their feedback, improve your pitch deck, and then pitch to the people that you like. Don't, don't pitch to people you like first. Those are the ones you want good feedback from. Start with the ones you don't give a shit about. Get their feedback, integrate that, and then pitch to the publishers you like. Free feedback, it's great. Um, so when it comes to um, uh, pitching, the moment you want to do it is effectively this weird Goldilocks moment where the further in development you go, right, the more clear it is how much value your game is worth. Right? So if you're two months from launch, it's fairly clear you're going to make about this much money. Now, it might be much more, it might be much less, but it's fairly clear. Right? Which means that for a publisher, the amount of money they're going to be able to give you is a much smaller ratio around that. For a publisher, financially, the smartest part to do it is the first moment where it's clear that this could be good. Right? Because at that point, the, the range of how much money this game can make is fairly large, which means they can offer fairly low, because you need that money. And the opportunity is fairly high. The further they go, the smaller that bounce get. So for publishers, the best moment to get your game is right around vertical slice, which means you start pitching in an ad advanced prototyping phase. So what I normally tell developers is here's what you need to pitch. You need three things. One. You need to be able to communicate. Two, you need to be able to prove what you communicate. So you say, this game is going to do this and this. You need to have prototypes to do that. It doesn't have to be one prototype. Please stop making one prototype with everything in there. Right? You can prove your game with several distinct prototypes and prove out that these things indeed all work. Right? That's totally fine. The third thing is you need to be able to communicate how it's going to look, feel, and sound, which you can do with a mock-up. You don't have to make the entire, this doesn't have to be in-engine. 
Your visuals don't have to be an engine to communicate how it's going to look. If you can do a clear example, engine fake, uh, Blender render, uh, Photoshop, I don't give a shit, of how it's going to look, you put those three things together, that's enough for most publishers to take a look at it and go like, you know what, this might be of interest, we would like to hear more. If they would like to hear more, very often if it's your first game, they're going to ask for a vertical slice because they can't know that you're not full of shit. Which is entirely fair, they're going to wait for you to prove that these things all come together into one game. If you've done a few games, and I don't know what your position in the industry is right now. It's over for OK, so if you've done a bunch of games, then usually the fact that you've shipped four others will be enough to have publishers look at that and sort of go like, OK, we can kind of extrapolate from what we have. They might ask for more information. But generally, you can sh start pitching advanced prototype. When you have how it looks, what it is, and the evidence that it does it, you're good to go. Cool. Thank you. Well, the one last question, one last Burning question from the audience. One more. Who wants to close it out? I would like to have one more, otherwise it's that awkward thing where there's one more question and then there's no question. Over here. The there we go. Lady with the braid. Thank you for the save there. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, always. So, thanks. And uh, I would like to elaborate a little bit more on this marketing thing because it's a real pain in the ass. <laughs> and I, the, the question would be, how would you propose to like educate those developers about right. the importance of marketing and importance of like starting doing marketing stuff at the very early stages. Right. I think I think the thing I normally teach developers is actually not really marketing. It's just communication, right? Because marketing is effectively mass communication in many cases. It's identifying where you're communicating, to who you're communicating, and what you're communicating. And the problem with the developers is that they usually know where they want to communicate although they usually define it as YouTubers, which is not a marketing strategy. Um, but they, the, the normally, their biggest problem is not that they can't figure out where to do it, they just haven't figured out what they're communicating. And that's a really weird thing to me, is that you can work on a game for two years and then at the end still don't really know how to talk about it. So that's why I always try to teach it as part of design. You know, how do we communicate this game effectively? How we, do we communicate the, the sort of core vision, the truth of this game to people in a way that is enticing, that gets people to, to want to play this game? And I think as soon as developers have that early in their process, it helps with playtests, it helps with development, it helps with alignment, it helps with sort of the creative core vision, it helps with key art, it helps with everything. So I try to kind of get developers to go back to the start of development and sort of like figure out what was at the core, like what made us interested? in making this game. And sometimes it's just like, yeah, we like roguelikes. Um, and then I say, okay, but you like roguelikes. What made you believe that it was worth developing a roguelike, right? Like, why, why, why? Like, and so often it's that really annoying game you play when you're a child where, you know, like, why is the sky blue? And it's like, well, it has to do with the light. And it's like, why? It's like, well, uh, uh, light is a wave. And it's like, why? That with your own development? is a really good way of figuring out why the fuck you're making video games and why the fuck you're making this video game is the one question you need to answer to be able to do good marketing. So that's usually where I go. I can add a little thing. We, we do similar things, me and Rami, if you don't mind. Uh, I see a lot of in the teams as well who are struggling with marketing. And one exercise that I put them through early on is to make a mock-up Steam pitch. You know, look at Steam Pitch out there. Try to articulate your vision to a game and what is the finished product look like? How would you articulate? You will see yourself which things actually sound really hype, which things are standing out. You can compare to other Steam pages that are released in that same genre. You can see how unique you really are. So that's a, a, a kind of start exercise. Just get into the mind of thinking yeah. about marketing. And also, it will immediately teach you that just saying, like, we have 12 characters is not actually interesting marketing, right? Because... You know, like you're like I've never I've never seen anybody go to a Steam page and go like, oh my god, this game is 12 characters. Fuck yeah, <laughs> like just that's not how it goes, right? So uh, that is a really good exercise to sort of like sort of visualize onwards into the process of where the page is going to be, um, and it teaches people a lot of wrong. Uh, it it remain it helps people understand a lot of wrong things they assume about how to communicate. So. Love that exercise. Might steal that. Yeah, rock and yes. All right, can we give a big round of applause for Rami? Yeah.